This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to, this, to those worshiping with us online and here in the sanctuary to Everett First Presbyterian Church. We would also like to welcome Jonna Reed, who will be leading us in worship this morning. I have a few announcements before we begin. This morning's Sunday School class will be led by Jonna and Calvin Lounge from 11.30 to 12.30. The discussion will be on the ministry in Central Asia. And for those of you online, you can find the Zoom link in the bulletin. Thursday's Bible study is at 4 p.m. and will be led by Shirley Solberg, and she will be covering 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, and you can also find the Zoom link in the bulletin. On Saturday, July 30th from 9 to 12, there will be a church work party. So on to mission. Um, I believe it was in 2004, 2005, when I saw an article in the Everett Herald that North Creek Presbyterian Church needed to take shelter from a hurricane while doing mission work in the Yucatan. I thought, mm, that would be a perfect experience for our youth. Not the hurricane, the mission work. So I, I sent an email to Yucatan Helping Hands to explore, the, to explore the opportunity for our youth to do mission work with them. In July 2006, off we went on our first mission trip to Chumbek. Here it is, three mission trips and 18 years later, and the relationship with Yucatan Helping Hands continues. And we are always grateful when the Ahinas come home to visit. If Byron Inez and Kavika will come forward and share with us on what Yucatan Helping Hands is doing. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, to see your faces, and uh, just to be uh, worshiping with you today. So thank you so much. Buenos dias. Aloha akakiaka. You thought that was hard. How about Ma'alop Apskab King? <laughs> we thought we'd add that as Inez and I have started learning Mayan, the native language in, uh, in Yucatan, Mexico. It's a pleasure and blessing to share with you today. Thank you so much, Everett Presbyterian, for your prayers and generous support of our ministry in Yucatan. This year, our furlough travels were limited due to the rise of costs in airfares and car rentals. Usually we rent a car in Orlando and return it here in Seattle two months later. But it went from $2,000 to almost $8,000. So we decided not to do it. Um, but you know, the biggest surprise for Inez and I was that when we were flying, the airlines seemingly are hiring teenage pilots. <laughs> you know? They looked right out of the youth club, youth group. Or maybe it has to do with my age. I don't know. We started our trip in Orlando in, uh, in May, Florida, and then made our way through Birmingham, Alabama, Rhinebeck, Iowa, San Diego, presenting updates to supporting churches and donors. After San Diego, we flew to Hawaii for my 50th high school reunion. Yes, 50th and also my family's reunion, which takes place, place every five years. These reunions are very dear to me, as I have lost so many of my classmates as well. Three of my older siblings have passed over the, between the last five years, so it was really important to, to have that connection between the younger, younger family members and, and the older family members. Let's see, we remain, no. We are presenting at three other churches here in the Pacific Northwest and visiting colleges as our little Kavika is entering his senior year in high school. 
So we're, later tomorrow, we're going to go visit Western Washington University. Yeah. Uh, we remain optimistic in our prayers for recruiting teams back to the Yucatan. As you know, we do construction for uh, new homes as well as water purification plants. We look forward to starting these projects up again with appropriate protocols in place. We're happy to know that your church has recommitted its plan to explore another mission trip next year. We look forward to working it out on this as we lean in God's direction. Lastly, we've been asked by our advisory board to start up an English class ministry as a, as a church outreach starting in Merida and then potentially doing the same in the rural areas. That's about it. God bless you and thank you for blessing our ministry. We uh, thank you for allowing us to share this morning. Thank you. Now, if you are able, please stand with me and join me in the call to worship. Let us hear what God the Lord has to speak. For El Shaddai will speak peace to her people, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely redemption is at hand for those who are in awe of God, whose glory dwells in our world. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteous and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give white credit. Praise to God. be seated. Please pray with me the prayer of confession. We look at our hurting world and wonder, has God forgotten to be merciful? Has the Lord anger withheld compassion? Gracious God, have mercy on us when we doubt your love 
because of the pain we feel and the violence we see. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is the great as our God. You are the God who performs miracles. Your path led through the mighty water, though your footprints were not seen. You came in power and grace, yet instead of awe, we felt nothing. Jesus, forgive us when we do not recognize the blessings you give, the miracles around us, or the paths you point us toward. Knowing that in Christ, we are welcomed with mercy and completely forgiven. Let's join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. God's grace and peace be with you. I'm Jonna. I've been here. We were trying to figure out when last. COVID has kind of thrown us for a loop. Um, uh, one, probably due to my overlooking and communicating with the office, we left out a scripture reading, and that's kind of important, or the sermon may be a bit more confusing. I'll be with you this week and next as part of the folks who are filling in for Pastor Allen's summer sabbatical. And I'm going to ask Inez to come up and read to you from Galatians 5, 13 to 18 and 22 to 25. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is, is opposed to the flesh. For, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform our hearts and minds through Jesus, the living word, who taught us to give our attention to God first, then neighbor, then ourselves. God, help us to do that today. Amen. Our gospel reading is from Luke, uh, chapter 12, verses 13 through 18. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Christ said to, them, to him, Friend, who sent me to be judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on guard against uh, all kinds of greed, for one's life does not, uh, does not consist in abundance of possessions. Then Jesus told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We face a dilemma every day amidst a babel of voices. And I have to say, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, is a scripture that has grabbed my attention recently. Amidst a babel of voices, how do we invest our inheritance? Now, our inheritance is all the blessings of time, gifts, funds, abilities, and assets that we hold individually 
and collectively. Um, but when, you know, we know the concept of not storing up for ourselves abundantly uh, as individuals or as a local church. But when and where to invest our blessings is a prayerful question. Let's look at our two New Testament passages uh, and then think about how we live that out in some current situations. Okay. The context of what comes before and after our passage in Luke 12 is important. You know, Jesus is pretty serious in this section of Luke. He's scolding the Pharisees. He's warning and encouraging the disciples. Uh, but after our verses, I think Jesus next to teaching our keys to responding as disciples to the calling in verse 21 to be rich toward God. In verses 22 to 34, we are invited to worry less and trust God more. That's an ongoing process. And in verses 35 through 48, Jesus exhorts or urges us to be watchful, serving in response to what God is doing and where the Spirit is moving. What is God doing? Are we in the action? In our passage in Luke 12, verses 13 and 14, records a man's question and Jesus' response about the division of wealth, which Jesus clearly thinks can be a question that can lead away from God. He declines to do it. His parable about a wealthy man storing his excess food in verses 16 to 20 illustrates why this is. That really wasn't a beneficial thing to do. It distracted him away from God. But I think the key points are in verse 15 that warns us against storing up in abundance, literally piling up to the sky. Um, and in verse 21, the being rich toward God. Now, like the anxious man who asks about finances, we can easily be in this place. Some of us are tired. Some of us feel uncertain about the future. You know, prices are rising. Um, and it's understandable to ask God to please divide up everything fairly and wisely and hopefully generously to me. Uh, but Jesus turns our attention elsewhere and especially warns about piling up massive amounts for ourselves without attention to what God, to where God is opening doors to witness to others about Christ's love using some of the blessings we hold. For our other texts, I want to point out some crucial details, because there are actually three things, not two, going on, flesh, law, and spirit, um, in especially that first part of Galatians 5. Flesh is not a word we use in daily conversation. And I think narrowing it to physical body only, though that's literally there in the text, is not the best interpretation. Instead, think about flesh as sinfulness, or as one commentator interpreted, self-centeredness. It is not about our physical bodies, but about our choices and priorities. How do we discern when competing voices fill our ears about how to use what we have been given? I think our application is to be rich toward God. Um, and if we ask God to enable us to not worry constantly in an uncertain world, and to be free to be on the watch for opportunities to serve as God opens doors. We need to foster those spiritual riches. But with all the conflict, pain, and tragedy in our nation and world, I believe we need some encouragement to do so. It may not seem productive, but I think we have to be ready internally before we can uh, be ready externally. We need to hear the promises of Galatians 5, 22 and 23 anew, not as a laundry list of two familiar words, especially for those of us who've been disciples for a few years, but we need to hear the fruit of the Spirit as a life-giving summons and a reminder of God's goodness, of Jesus' heart of compassionate healing, and the Spirit's grace and strength. I'll read Galatians 5, 22 and 23 twice, but I'm going to read it first from the message translation, then the passion translation. But what happens when we live God's way? The Spirit brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, 
exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Here's the Passion Translation. But the fruit provided by the Holy Spirit within you is divine. This love is revealed through joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. Never set a law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Later, the message translation of Galatians 5 encouraged us to live in the spirit in our daily activities. Let us make sure that we do not hold it as an idea in our heads or as a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in the details of our lives. The Greek for Galatians 5.26 is six simple words, and two of those words are spirit. A close translation of the Greek is, if spirit living, then spirit walking. Or, if spirit enlivened, then spirit guided. The Passion translation renders this verse as follows. We have now chosen to live in the surrendered freedom of yielding to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're letting the Spirit flow in us and form us and guide us. But so how can we not store up our blessings, but instead release them wisely and kindly? Here are some possibilities and examples. As we make our choices, we need to prayerfully listen as individuals, as a church body, in our local community, and in networks of the global body of Christ, the church. My first example is where local churches meet local community. You know, as you look around Everett and Snohomish County, what stirs you in a- to action? I'll give a couple of ideas that come to mind, but with your deeper knowledge of the community, the Holy Spirit may lead you to something else. You know, Dinner at the Bell is a long-standing ministry, one evening every week, with other churches offering food on different days than ever it does. What might changes in food prices or availability of jobs? How might those impact this ministry? Or might those changes point a way for some participants to reduce their reliance on free meals? What is needed for someone to have more resources to purchase food um, and need meals less? Or secondly, what about affordable housing? Uh, here in Everett and the other nearby communities. You know, housing access is a cooperative effort of government and business and community, including churches and everyone who lives here. Maybe your local Love Your Neighbor ministry is something else, not Dinner at the Bell or housing. Or maybe it's a next step on a program you are already doing with a couple of other churches in Everett. May God lead you in unity, passion, strength, and grace. It is a good season to take time to gently consider uh, and boldly dream what could be. And second, we, we think about when the local church partners with the global church, and that's in the Yucatan or among refugees or something else. Um, sometimes due to scale and distance, the best path is engaging with partnerships to serve people in places we can't easily reach from our local area. These include participating in special offerings, such as one great hour sharing that addresses hunger and empowers uh, marginalized and indigenous communities, or giving above and beyond for disaster response and recovery or for a refugee crisis. I know that Everett participates in a few of these cooperative efforts. And here's a real example from 2022. A recent earthquake that killed more than 1,000 people in Asia and injured more than 3,000 and overwhelmed the five small local hospitals in the region. The tremors struck very early in the morning local time on a Tuesday 
And by Friday, a partner organization was already there giving assistance. It's a collaborative effort. So I was able to quickly learn how our partner is responding. Following the earthquake, I had an email from the assessment team. Here it is. The journey to the remote district is not easy and roads are poor. We now have a team of 22 people, 13 who are medical, and the rest are logistics and support. Besides medical assistance, we are providing vehicles with basic food and blankets. Many houses were destroyed. Some families were killed except for the babies, or in some houses have only a widow now. Many are living under a tarp for shelter. Um, the work is hard, and there are many tears. That's the end of the report, but I can share more during the session at 11.30 today. Because the local team was already there on the ground, and their global links were strong, help came quickly. And um, these people knew they were not forgotten in their time of suffering. We invest, when we invest in global partners, we honor God by making tangible signs of Christ's compassion possible on short notice in others' time of need. In summary, in the last chapter of 1 Timothy, Paul urges Timothy to live his faith as a young pastor by teaching those in his likely house church about themes similar to our scriptures today. In 1 Timothy uh, 6, 17 and 18, Paul encourages Timothy and his congregation and us to put our hope in God's provision as we become rich in good works, giving generously. Our challenges are to allow the Spirit to constantly renew us and to be ready to discern when and where to invest our blessings. By Jesus' grace, it is possible. Amen. Um, please stand in body or spirit as you are able. Uh, as we read an affirmation of faith, it is from the Confession of 1967, um, and really talking about this new life in the spirit that we seek. Please read with me. The new life finds a direction in the life of Jesus, his deeds and words, his struggle against temptation, his compassion, his anger, and his willingness to suffer death. The teaching of the apostles and prophets guides men and women in living this life, and the Christian community nurtures and equips them for their ministries. The members of the church are emissaries of peace and seek the good of all in cooperation with powers and authorities in politics, culture, and economics. But they have to fight against pretensions and injustice when these same powers endanger human welfare. Their strength is in their confidence that God's purpose, rather than human schemes, will finally prevail. Life in Christ is life eternal. The resurrection of Jesus is a sign that God will consummate the work of creation and reconciliation beyond death and bring to fulfillment the new life begun in Christ.
Sisters and brothers, your charge this week is to be filled with a joy that overflows and a peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit, celebrating that all these are gifts from God through the Holy Spirit. Go now in the love of our Creator, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.